Hello artists, today I'm talking about Lowenfeld stages of development. Now a lot of times in my teaching job uh, I'm teaching adults and this is fascinating because uh, a lot of times they come from very different backgrounds and very different personal relationships that they have to art. And I think Lowenfeld stages of development is really useful as a tool to look back and unpack like why we like drawing or maybe why we don't like drawing and how we can take a little more of an objective uh, forgiving look at our own art and how we can uh, go forward. So basically, uh, Lohenfeld stages of development researches how basically kids hit certain milestones where they advance in drawing skills. And basically every kid goes through this in the same order. It just happens at different times for different children. And sometimes uh, kids learn really fast, sometimes kids don't. And so reflecting back on them is a really good way to tell where you're at today. So. The scribbling phase is basically just when you give a kid a crayon and they have no knowledge of their own kinetic relationship with their brain and their hand and their eyes. And so when you give it to them and they just go like this, uh, you know, they don't know what they're doing. So it's just you know lots of blotches and just scribbly stuff. My personal reflection on the scribbling phase is that I remember being a child and seeing my parents write checks or something or sign envelopes. And I thought, oh, I can write in cursive too. Look at me, I'm writing in cursive. And it's not cursive, but it was one of those things where we're just developing that hand-eye coordination and we don't actually understand that, you know, physical ink is gonna come out of the tip of this pen when I put it on the paper. And children are like still learning that when you give it to them when they're like three years old. But all kids naturally, if you give them something to make a mess, they'll go make a mess, they'll have fun. Uh, the pre-schematic phase is when this idea of kinetic hand, eye, and brain start connecting together. And kids start understanding that a drawing on a two-dimensional surface can represent something. Uh, so it's really interesting because they don't necessarily know how to draw in any way, but they are able to conceptualize an idea. And so they all start doing this uh, similar stuff. A lot of times it's known as tadpole people where they're drawing the information first, really. It's like they draw the important information. And so like really what they think of is the eyes are really important. And you know, a lot of times these have like tiny little bodies and weird feet. And then they'll have big hands and big feet. And they'll have like little stick figure hands. And the other thing you'll find is that they have no concept of the picture plane. So when they draw this, they just continue drawing other things up here where it's more people. Uh, they'll also draw mandalas a lot. They'll draw things with spiral or circular shapes a lot. And it's one of those things where somehow their brain is starting to crank out ideas of, you know, what are we trying to conceptualize when we draw stuff? Uh, this advances to the schematic phase, which refers to like the flat 2D nature of a lot of kids' drawings. So at this stage, you have a lot of this, where it's a flat line, and you have a box for a house, and there's a roof on the house, and it's got a door, and maybe some windows, and this represents their house, usually. And it's lots of stick figures, where this is mom, and this is dad, and this is me, I'm the little kid in this picture. And over here, a happy tree. And up here in the corner, you have what's uh, a classic schematic uh, element, which is the upper left hand sun. So again, there's a couple of things going on. They understand this as a flat two dimensional surface, but you don't see people um, crossing the horizon. You don't have a sense of depth yet. And kids sort of stay in this for a while until they start moving to the dawning realism phase. And this is where they start getting things like overlapping things. You'll see boys draw, you know, something like, oh, here's my cool weapon. And, uh, you know, I remember a lot of these stages through what I was drawing at the time. Um, so I remember like the specific things I draw drew a lot was like I remember you know I remember putting a horizon behind my character and suddenly seeing that the other one I remember is like I was really into Jurassic Park and so I remember this idea of like the zigzag leg of a 
velociraptor foot. <clears throat> and how the arm would be like separate from this. And then you'd have this big T-Rex arm. Your mouth. But similarly, you can have a leg in behind that. And you have that sense of depth starting to show up. And again, the ability to see uh, horizon. This is sometimes called the gang phase because a lot of times when we're drawing in this phase, we're drawing with friends. And drawing is actually a really, really social activity. You're doing it with friends where you're both drawing the same thing. You might both be drawing Roblox. You might both be drawing uh, aliens. Or you, must, you might both be drawing superheroes. Um, and so like you get together with your friends and you oftentimes construct stories in a team element. And uh, you know, I remember some of my classic things. I loved Godzilla, so I was drawing monsters all the time. And I loved when friends would draw monsters with me. Uh, the other thing I would draw is like, I remember the killer tomatoes. And so, you know, all the time we would draw this uh, killer tomato formula, which is you would draw a Pac-Man, and you'd put the tomato on top, the little tomato seeds here. You'd make a circle, and you'd make an angry eye, and then you'd put the teeth on the tomato. And just all sorts of things like this, where uh, the fact that your friend was into the same show or video game as you would mean that you would draw these things together. and. Um, this means that we start having peer pressure. A lot of times we're drawing things because our friends are telling us, let's all draw this same thing. Uh, and then uh, also we start having comparative drawings. So we stop drawing for ourselves and we start drawing in comparison to the world society around us. So you start looking at other people's art and saying, oh, that guy's a lot better than me. Or if you're better than somebody, kids are heartless monsters and we'll just come out and say, wow, that's not very good. Mine is better. <laughs> and so this leads us into the pseudo realism phase. And in the pseudo realism phase, kids are sort of aware that art might have an objective framework of quality where something is better if it's more realistic and worse if it's not realistic. And so they start focusing on these problems a lot. And so you start seeing people, you know, You'll see kids start to draw faces where they're trying to have um, more realistic face features. So a lot of times this is when you start seeing sort of the diamond lips and uh, you know eyelashes on you know your your girl characters is a big uh, tell. <clears throat> so a lot of times you're trying to get this realism and it sucks because you can't and. It's really frustrating to try your best to make it look like a realistic person. And it's just not working, you know? And so we start looking at our drawings and we think, this is a source of pain. I am not good at it. <laughs> uh, and so this is something that's funny because um, a lot of students at this stage, they decide, I'm never going to draw again. Drawing is not for me. <laughs> And this leads us to the decision phase. The big decision in the decision phase is drawing or not drawing. So many, many people at this point say, drawing is not bringing any value to my life. Uh, I'm not enjoying it. Uh, existence is pain when I draw because I see every flaw in my drawings. Uh, the amount of work it takes to get good at drawing is so astronomical that a lot of people just give up at this point. And that's kind of okay. I think a lot of society just can be fine with that. It's not a big deal. But if you continue drawing, it leads to a lot of other decisions too. So one thing is meaning. A lot of times we have more meaning. It doesn't matter if your art is good or bad. What if it's speaking about... Uh, a topic that you find really important, like uh, political topics or voting or uh, your personal culture and background. Somehow making art for that doesn't have to be uh, Leonardo da Vinci's perfect draftsmanship. It can just be where it is, but it has cultural meaning and that meaning makes it nice. The other thing you can do is in fact, you work at it. You keep drawing and you keep drawing and eventually you're like, okay, now I can draw a human face pretty realistically.
And, you know, you keep drawing after that. Maybe that face needs more work. You might start going to life drawing. You might uh, learn new mediums that are more difficult, like oil or painting or uh, acrylic. And uh, the other thing is that I don't necessarily think people decide to not draw. There's all sorts of professional uses for drawing that people go on and continue to use. And it's all about that connection between your hand and your brain and your eyeball. And how do you do that? So a good example is like in the world of uh, you know, web design and UI UX, you have wireframing. Maybe you're not drawing stuff, but you're examining how a layout makes for a more beautiful or less beautiful iPhone app. <clears throat> Maybe you just need uh, the ability to think on paper. All these things are uh, maybe like you go into medicine and you need to be able to explain uh, the esophagus uh, the esophagus goes down into the stomach and then you got your duodenum and so on and so forth because maybe you're talking to people in the doctor's office about that so uh, drawing still continues uh, even when we go through these but one of the things I like about Lohenfeld's stages of development and what I wanted to go back to talking about this is I kind of can find meaning in every single one of these stages even as I get older and older and older so scribbling for instance Scribbling is totally an acceptable rendering method where you do something like this. This is like a contour drawing where you just let the lines keep going. And I'm basically treating this like I'm still a little kid and I'm drawing as if I'm pretending to be my parents doing cursive writing. And suddenly, voila, face. It's still scribbling, but it's a face, you know? The pre-schematic phase, uh, I kind of love for its caricature implications. All these things can, uh, you know, when you learn how to draw objective realism, that's great, but eventually it gets kind of boring. And it's really fun to make someone look more like themselves when you do caricature or cartooning. Schematic phase, what is the schematic phase when you're going into game development? if not two-dimensional level design for two-dimensional gameplay. How do you have Mario run along here and jump up here? So level design, uh, designing sprite animations and elements for 2D animation still matters here. Dawning realism in the gang phase I actually think is my most important stage because this was in your childhood when you really connected with drawing stuff because you loved it and I love it when students can go back to that and figure out what do I love and how can I just draw that all the time so you know we teach a lot of things where you have to learn life drawing and perspective and uh, how to shape weld objects together but you can do that on anything and instead of doing it on a teacup or a landscape do it on the stuff you love so if you love monsters go back to monsters and try and figure out How can you make this monster something that relates to what you loved when you were a kid? So all the time, this is something I love doing, is just scribbling out some sort of monster or alien. Just because it's always something that I think appeals to me personally. And then the decision phase, I do think about how um, we need to evolve as people and we're always going forward. So, you know, in my personal life, I've done a lot of 3D animation and all the time, and every you know person who's done 3D modeling or sculpting talks about this, but when you draw, you get better at 3D modeling and your 3D modeling makes you better at drawing. And it makes you think about things like uh, contours, like, you know, how do we build the human face out of polygons. And so the more you 3D model, the more you start 
understanding geometry in a way that can apply to your drawing skills. So, I want you to think about these things. How do you relate to the Lowenfeld stages of development? What were you doing when you drew with friends and just had a blank piece of paper and had a great time? What can you pull from your childhood, even back when you were scribbling? Uh, again, how can you just think about this as something that's a relationship between your hands and your brain and your eyeballs and put that all together so that you can draw in a kinetic way? And then lastly, how can you advance into the future making important decisions about how drawing is something that's going to be a part of your life? Thanks for watching.